I am Eva O, and this is the Teaking Podcast. I have been a dominatrix since 2011, and I would like to spill the tea on my life. Thank you for listening. The ultimate sex party episode. Or maybe we should say episodes. <laughs> I would like to take this opportunity to tell you about my sex party past, about what sex parties are, about what I think makes a good one, and about the many that I've been to. And I don't normally write notes for any of these episodes, it's usually totally off the cuff, but I've had to write a little bit of a list because there have been a lot of parties <laughs> that I have done some very hard research at just for this particular moment now, just for my hedonism to be indulged. <laughs> Let me get the phone. But let's see if I need it. Let's see, I'm going to try to go a little chronologically and by geography, so maybe I won't need it, but we'll see. So first of all, let's start off with what is a sex party? So a sex party is a gathering. Could be five people in a hotel room. Could be 2,000 people on a weekend in Jamaica. This has happened. <laughs> yeah, maybe more than 2,000. But it's essentially a gathering that is centered around the interaction of sexuality. It doesn't necessarily have to integrate penetrative sex. You have kink parties that discourage any penetration, for example or you have very like specific fetish parties that might just be about medical fetish or leather boots worship, you know? Or you have also queer parties or more heteronormative parties you have, which are usually within the swingers sort of territory of things. But yes, so that's generally what a sex party is, a gathering around people who want to engage in sexuality together in its myriad of forms. Sometimes it includes food, sometimes it doesn't. Some of them are sober. And these happen everywhere, everywhere. I originally come from a Muslim country, but it's very, very local. And I can tell you, it happens. <laughs> it happens everywhere. So. What can these look like? Yeah? How do we find out what is of interest to us? I think that I have done a lot of research and I've tried <laughs> a lot of different ways of interacting and being and enjoying. And I enjoy a pocket of different things in mostly the queer scene and the queer kink scene these days. Uh, my thorough research has brought me to this conclusion for myself. But for you, it's going to look different, potentially, and it can also shift. And that is a lovely opportunity to be able to indulge. But how did I even understand that these things were a thing? How did I even find them? How does anybody find them? I found out because I became a dominatrix. <laughs> And I was suddenly exposed to all of these much more sexually aware people than I was who were going to sex parties and who invited me to a big event called Hellfire in Sydney. And now this was like a sex forward party. I wouldn't say that there was a lot of play going on. There was a bit of play, but it was a little bit more like performances and fashion like you could dress up in latex or leather and it was a, a chance for that community to mingle and gather and yeah sure play a little bit but it wasn't like a heaving sort of sex party and there are versions which are like this also and that was my first time sort of being in a space where outside of the dungeon outside of private one-on-one -on -one time where I saw like people just like getting flogged or like sucking on feet or just like feeling erotically charged in the space that they sh are sharing with strangers essentially. 
and that was lovely. I didn't get up to any play at all. I just mostly had a drink with the mistresses who were kind enough to bring me that day and got a few photos taken by the house photographer, my latex, and that was that. And but it did pique a little interest for me. And so I started like looking around for other options. And the other options that I found were swingers clubs. And so these were facilities where they love to have a hot tub. Don't love a public hot tub, but they love to have a hot tub. And rooms full of like mass mattresses or soft like areas, maybe the occasional little bit of BDSM dungeon furniture and like mostly couples would go and have sex with each other, swap partners, have sex randomly, you know, it's um, have sex only them, but in a public space. And a lot of the times because of the licensing, I guess it was BYO, which I thought was very nice. <laughs> you bring your own drinks and there would be somebody there to pour it for you. And then you can like walk around and watch people having sex and then maybe indulge yourself. And I very rarely actually indulged with like people who I hadn't known before. I would always end up going with like friends that I would have sex with or as people who I was seeing and then I would have sex with them there. But um, yeah, and so that's also a possibility for you. You don't have to go to these spaces and just be like, oh, but do I have to do everything with everyone? It's like, well, the ideal space is going to make sure that you understand principles of consent and Therefore, part of that is doing what you feel comfortable with, right? And I guess that's like a central tenet that you want to look for when you're looking at these sex parties, whatever sort of spectrum of size or location or however. It's what kind of structure and principles are they uh, talking about, adhering to? And if you have a question on how do you ensure everyone's consent, their participation is like agreed upon that how how do you ensure that this is a safer space for for me attending if you have that question and they don't have an answer then that's probably not something that's going to be uh, safer for you to partake in and often the bigger parties will also have safeguards or people who are there to look out for you that you can call on and it would be good to be aware of what they are marked by. You know, maybe they're wearing a certain like color band or something like this on the night or like a certain bag or however. And it would they can also help you when you need or to be acclimatized to the environment or however, you know. So I think that these are probably markers of a sex party that I would feel better recommending also. But anyway, me in these swingers clubs... They definitely didn't talk to me about consent. They definitely didn't talk to me <laughs> about <laughs> about uh, who I could call on. Very rarely, actually, unfortunately. And now I've come to learn that at least this was like the early 2000s or so, maybe. And uh, you could, you could, that these kinds of conversations weren't as common as they are now. And I kind of remember reading at one of these places that if you wanted to do with it, something with anyone, you would touch their elbow. <laughs> yeah, which personally doesn't feel like enough. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's good to understand the rules of the space. Yeah. And to know whether they align with what you are comfortable indulging in. So sad enough of sort of like an intro to what a sex club is and how I started my slow foray into it. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps. Mm. But how did it evolve into my fairly wide understanding of what is possible now? Because I started in like a touch of a kink party and a very heteronormative uh, swinger space, right? Which never super spoke to me, but they were what was available. And I didn't know what to Google for the rest of it. <laughs> but over time, I came to understand that you could find event listings and groups on FetLife.com, which is like a kink uh, Facebook of sorts. And I don't love it 
as a way to communicate or to meet people on the platform. But in terms of listings, it's actually still fairly good at, at sharing what is available. Like I found events in like Oslo, like clubs and these things called munches, which are like social gatherings uh, where no play happens, but you meet people who are like-minded. In Hong Kong, I found a community who I will not go into too much because they're a little bit guarded, fairly so, but you can meet them for the munch and then be invited to private spaces after. And this is often the format for when you're meeting up for these munches, uh, that they will kind of vet you to see how you fit and vibe with them, and then eventually to like okay you for a potential play space. But but also over time I found more like swinger club sort of things, but more queer focused. So there's spaces in New York, NSFW, for example, that are a little bit more queer friendly and a little bit more kink friendly, even though there's still a lot of penetrative sex going on there. But that's like a physical location that you can go to multiple times a week, which is quite nice. And we don't have that. We do have swingers, um, saunas actually, in London, but nothing that I would feel particularly enthralled to hang out in just yet, maybe in time. But there are a hell of a lot of parties that are available in London. And I think that's what taught me a little bit more about the breadth of what's possible. Yeah. So I think that for me, like what I was saying before, in terms of what I find interesting, it's definitely more queer, it's more fluid spaces, it's more kink focused. But in London, you have the really big parties like the Clever Bootens, uh, where it's like a thousand plus people who are doing kink play, but also penetrative sex. And it's also like a dance sort of rave. You have Joyride, you have Pinky Promise, uh, you have... Uh, and then, and then you also have things that are more focused. Things like uh, a, the Leather Dyke meetups which are focused more around uh, dyke culture and leather culture. And like, so there are people who are there just to polish boots and who, who really worship leather in and of itself. And, you know, you can get more specialized medical play only parties. It's like, it can become more... <laughs> yeah. And I think I'm going to refer to my notes actually because I feel like I'm missing out on some things but let's see let's see let's see let's see where are the notes I don't even know where they are I don't ever look at them okay yeah ah also mm. yeah and so all of these parties that I mentioned they're all sort of like pop-up spaces right there are pop-up spaces where you can kind of like follow the party and then they're moving around quite a lot. And then I have mentioned that you do have some what they call clubhouses, like the one in New York that I mentioned. And then you have like the swinger sort of facilities that are very, very common uh, in a lot of spaces. But I would also recommend listening to my Berlin episode, my Berlin travel episode, because I go into spaces there in depth, but just to quickly touch on them, like you have some very dedicated BDSM like spaces where they don't throw parties, where it's just like they're open on these certain nights and you can go and use their equipment, which could include like an isolation cell or uh, a, a row of multiple cells all together or they have a really nice chill out area where there's shibari suspension points you know and i would like to see actually that kind of a space in london <laughs> wish list <laughs> but 
Yeah, and then you also have the bigger, like, rave sort of established parties in Berlin, like the Kit Kat Club, and that's all. That's also open multiple times a week, and it's quite a big space that's open to play. But, but yeah, yeah, and then like I was mentioning a little bit earlier, you have these weekenders essentially, and I, I mean, Miami Fetish Weekend is one that I know about. And in some ways, like a German fetish ball can also maybe be considered verging on this a little bit. But I think spaces more that have this hotel that's designated for everybody to be around. And then they have all of these different uh, events that happen at the hotel. It's like naked, like swimming time or whatever 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 i clearly i haven't been to one of these because the idea of spending a weekend with thousands of people isn't super really my my thing <laughs> but it sounds pretty fun for some other people yeah so the the sex party gamut can really go from this little like tiny organized super selected maybe even a friend group sort of a scenario all the way up to these massive heaving travel destination sort of monstrosities <laughs> so it's really up to i guess what you're responding to and what titillates you but in general i think it doesn't matter the size that there's always there's these principles of are people thinking about how your consent and your safety are going to be taken into account? Are the organizers thinking about that? I think is the, the main focus of what that could look like. And I have a few other favorites that I really want to mention before rounding this off. And then maybe I'll continue this as like a series where I talk about parties specifically. That could be cute, right? where I talk about a party and like why I'm interested in it, how I found it. I mean, I sort of did this with Club Verboten in season two, where we did a really special episode where we went into the club and showed you what it looked like. And I interviewed people who were running it. But that it's quite a lot to do that. <laughs> but maybe one day if I, if I, have a the thing is like i have people who want to sponsor this but i really don't i don't know it feels like so personal i don't really feel like doing that but maybe one day if i have a budget for for that maybe i'll fly around the world going to these <laughs> monstrosities and i'll let you know all about it i don't know let's see let's see where it goes but let's see oh so i mentioned hellfire in sydney which isn't around anymore did I talk about the Orgy Dome? I don't think I did. The Orgy Dome is this space in um, Burning Man, which the first time I went was a very long time ago. And I mean, that's a whole other episode because <laughs> I like backpacked it alone essentially. But the Orgy Dome is like a pop-up uh, swingers space club. But they do have a constant talk there, which is good. Uh, in the middle of Burning Man, the desert, that's there for a week. And like a lot of work goes into it. I ended up camping with them two years ago. They air condition it for you. And anyway, so it's like, there's sex clubs everywhere. <laughs> uh, Club Verboten, Kit Kat, in Dungeon, German Fetish Ball, which isn't super much like a sex party, but it's more like a community sort of gathering. The Berlin Open Dungeons. Ah, yeah, Insomnia in Berlin. If you want to hear my opinions about that, listen to the Berlin travel episode. Mm, when I was in Bali also, I came across some munches that went into kink parties. Um, NSFW. Oh, Sanctum. Sanctum in New York. I mean, I like Sanctum now. It's very expensive to attend. I think it's like upwards of two thousand dollars, maybe two thousand five. Um, and I really didn't used to like it. I used to think that it was a lot of super hot women, which is great. I mean, I liked that part, 
but then like men who did not really match them like uh, like uh, in hotness <laughs> it was the money the moneyed men meeting the hot women who were invited maybe i was one of them <laughs> but uh but now that's under new creative direction and i think it's a uh, much more like nice sort of crowd and the vibe just is a little more less creepy more luxurious which is always what they were going for but in my opinion it wasn't really that so i think i would like to talk about that one actually maybe that can be an interesting an interesting sex party individual opinion thing mm. and there's also all women's and or lesbian nights um, in London, there's one night, which is by my friend, and then there's uh, X Rage, which is really fun. I've only been to one event, but I had not heard like music like that in a non cis het male dominated environment before. So it was like dance hall and like. Uh, hip hop and there was like a lot of grinding going on but just because it was all lesbian it was much hotter <laughs> so I thought that was really fun and I would love to go to that again actually and then you have some like uh countering to the big like parties that are happening such as scene in London which is more about they call themselves the bartenders bar for kink people so it's like a lot of industry folk is kind of what they're going for but yeah and then you have and then i kind of list the in my notes london bali hong kong norway singapore everywhere <laughs> so yeah that was my intro to sex parties episode and my intro to the very long list of things that <laughs> i've been going to over the last years and that's not even to mention, you know, the corners of clubs that are welcoming to sex positive interactions like Bergai, for example, which I also go into on my Berlin travel episode. But I think that's probably that's probably enough information for you to Google for now, isn't it? If only I had this information. <laughs> When I first started, I wouldn't have had to do all of that incredible research for you. But thank you for listening and indulging my deviance. And I look forward to speaking with you next time. <laughs>